Hi, Matt Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Synopsys with Sal Alvarez, who's going to talk today about a flow for functional safety verification. So, Sal, we're used to thinking about a flow for functional verification. What is, what's different in safety verification? If we look back at the semiconductor industry 20 years ago, we see that the beginning of complex SOCs, which is still the same problem we have today with safety verification. Back then, we also had the addition of dramatically increasing manufacturing costs, which really pushed an evolution of functional safety methodology. Now, the good news is, since we've already solved this problem before, we can reuse a lot of the techniques that we've learned and apply them to safety verification. There are a couple of differences. First of all, the motivation for functional verification was really money, having Good designs that we could use without having to re-spin them saved us a lot of money. And in safety verification, our primary motivation needs to be on people, their safety and their wellness. If something goes wrong functionally, though, that could be a problem. If something goes wrong safety-wise, that's a much bigger problem, right? So you have to be even that much more accurate than you did in the past. The main differences are, first of all, your motivation. We want to make sure that uh, people are safe. That's not a consideration in functional verification. So we are, everything we do has to be to make sure people are safe. And the second difference, major difference, is in functional verification, we care about making sure the design works as we've spec'd it out, that it works as intended. In safety verification, these chips are already out on the road. So what happens when they don't work as expected? Because realistically, no one can guarantee a chip is going to work 100% of the time correctly forever. In reality, they're going to wear down. They're going to be hit with alpha particles. So how do we protect the design when it doesn't work as intended? And that's what we get to when we talk about safety verification. And how do you protect that design? We add safety mechanisms to the design to let us know, hey, this chip is not working as intended, and we let the system know so it can mitigate what happens when things don't work as intended. So why don't you draw this out for us? Sure. So Sal, what's the first consideration here? The first thing we do is we take a look at the design and see what are the various things that can go wrong in the design, and what safety mechanism can I put, introduce into the design to protect against these failure modes go from going wrong. And this analysis is called the failure mode effect analysis. And that's where we're really going to start off. But at the end of the day, what we really want to do is we want to generate what's called the FMEDA, where the D is the diagnostics and gives us our metric values that show the proof that our safety mechanisms really are as effective as they need to be. And this has to happen over time too, right? So you now th are looking at this in terms of not only a flow that starts with the design of the chip, but how it's actually going to perform in the marketplace later on. That's right. Our job never finishes. And what we want to do is we want to catch all of those issues up front as close. We don't want to wait till the very end. So what we want to do is generally the ISO standard says we must validate our design as close to the final product as possible. In semiconductor, that's often the net list. But we don't want to wait till the net list to start their safety verification. So we can go ahead and start our safety verification at the early RTL stage, even before we have test benches available by doing static analysis on the design. And we can see if the design gets stuck at, uh, at a one or zero, can that one or zero propagate to some safety points. And then also, if it does, we can do backtracing algorithms to see how likely our safety mechanisms are to catch that. How much of a loop back is there from what's going on out in the field back into the flow here? Well, the field experience is also important for future designs and learnings. We have to keep in mind, we have to keep monitoring how well our chips are doing in the market. But in the design process, uh, hopefully, you've already taken those learnings and applied that to your current design. So let's drill down into this. How does this actually work? Well, once we've done the early RTL in our design process, we then want to continue with in increased confidence at the RTL 
stage where we have a test bench. But we don't want to run all the faults. In it's, so we want to take some sampling of faults. And this will enable a, a couple things. First of all, we will be able to uh, create the uh, fault campaign environment. Can I step? We will create initial stimulus based off our test benches. And most important, we will start seeing how effective our safety mechanisms are. As we continue through the process where we have maturing RTL, we will want to increase the number of faults that we're running. And in this process, we will also create a stimulus library. So that finally, when we get to the final fault campaign, we can reuse this library and when we already have the environment and we're all set to execute. Typically, RTL is pretty far into the process to actually make some changes. Is a lot of this done in simulation ahead of time as well? Right. So the idea here is that when we're running the fault campaigns here, we're mostly uh, focused on the simulation. And it's not until we get to the final fault campaign that we bring it all together for the final coverage numbers. So that brings up a good question. How do the other tools fit into this? So that's a great question. And so let's look at how this final fault campaign actually looks. What we're going to do is we're going to create a database of all the faults. And all the tools are going to understand faults in the same way. We don't want to send anything we don't need to to any of the fault engines. So we'll, we'll do some structural analysis when we create the faults so that we can remove some safe faults. And these could be faults that are identical to each other. We don't need to run them all. And we can remove structurally safe faults. So we can do this right away without even sending to any fault engine. Then what we'll do is we'll use fault simulation to analyze, along with our stimulus library, these faults in here. And we'll write back the results. And this is going to look very similar to functional verification coverage, where we're going to get some numbers up front very quickly. Then, for the remaining faults, just reusing what we've learned in functional verification, we're going to want to send some faults for formal analysis. So instead of waiting to analyze all these, we can get a bump where we can find what's more formally proven safe faults. Now some faults we may have to run emulation on. These are going to be faults that maybe use software, be te uh, software test libraries or just require long run times to analyze. And then in addition, we may even run analog fault, sim fault sim simulation. And during this process, we may do coverage analysis or debugging in the same platforms. So having all of these tools, uh, understanding faults in the same way, really enables us to finish this fault campaign much quicker. One of the big issues in verification is always coverage, right? And this is a fairly complex flow, right? Just as functional verification is a complex flow, fault simulation can also, or fault campaign can also be a complex flow. But having all of these tools understanding faults in the same way and interpret and sharing the results really does enable the time to closure to be much quicker. What's been the response from uh, some of the uh, OEMs working in this field? They're always concerned about quality and uh, uh, safety. Um, 
how have they looked at something like this? What they care about most is this FMEDA. And they get a lot more added uh, confidence when you're able to then take these results, back annotate them to your FMEDA, and generate your work products where you not only uh, you not only have the claim that your safety mechanisms have an effectiveness, you now have the proof you need to show that my safety mechanisms do in fact work as they, as they need to. So whenever you're working in verification, there's always that, that pause where you sign off and say, okay, do I really have enough confidence in this design or do I have to go back and do more, more work and think about this in a different way? Will they have enough confidence to sign off on this? Well, that's exactly the beauty of this flow. At the early RTL, we're getting some confidence already. When we're doing the RTL sampling, we're getting even more confidence. As we go down these steps, we gain more and more confidence that we're on the right track, we're doing things properly, and this will, in fact, work as we intend it to work. Sal Alvarez, thanks for a great explanation. You're welcome.